night from Baltimore. The only way to understand the enormity of this disaster is from the water. Yo, what the f How in the world does a thousand foot ship run into one of America's most important bridges? The Mayday call that undoubtedly saved countless lives. The entire key bridge has fallen into the harbor. The frantic search for survivors in ink black water how did things on this ship go so wrong so quickly from when it left port? Who really is at fault here, and could it have been prevented? Good evening from Baltimore. As we come on the air, it's been nearly 18 hours since the massive cargo ship brought down one of America's most important bridges. The sun sets with at least six victims still trapped in 50 feet of water about a half mile out behind me in Baltimore Harbor. What strikes you is just the size of the ship right now behind me. If you look out, the ship dwarfs the bridge. There are dive teams in the water. There are helicopters overhead. At about 130 right now, so that would be 0130 Eastern last night, a cargo ship headed to Sri Lanka and it slammed into the bridge. Issued a mayday call sometime in the minutes right before this, it crashed into the bridge. You can see on a sped up timeline of video of the ship coming, the lights going on and off, indicating the power failure on that ship. It was quite literally drifting into the bridge, 97,000 tons of it. And there are some very chilling radio calls as the people who run the bridge try to shut the bridge down from traffic before the boat slammed into it. We advise the entire bridge, the entire key bridge in the harbor. I advise to hold all traffic from committing to the bridge. I advise again, the entire key bridge has fallen into the harbor. And to give you an idea of the dolly, the container ship that is behind me, 985 feet long. For context, that's about the same height as the Eiffel Tower, less than 100 feet shorter than an aircraft carrier. It is enormous. It's also extremely wide, 157 feet to be exact. That allows it to carry all of the containers on board. The Roman Colosseum at its tallest point is 157 feet, so it is as wide as the Colosseum is tall. The big focus of the investigation right now is on the sheer weight of the ship, somewhere between 95,000 tons and 97,000 tons. That is the same as 285 fully loaded 747s slamming into the bridge. The video indicates, and investigators say, that at some point the ship lost power a couple of different moments. It appeared to regain that power at some point. But either way, there is no way to stop 97,000 tons. When it slammed in to the Francis Scott Key Bridge, it brought down one of the most important bridges for moving hazardous materials, gas, propane, chemicals like that, north to south on the East Coast. In fact, the ship is so large, you can see that the bridge now is resting on the ship. And it's gonna take months to clear the harbor. This is the Baltimore Harbor that is the fifth busiest on the East Coast. It's gonna take years to fix the bridge. If you leave on the East Coast, you're going to start feeling the effects on this in terms of what you can get in goods and services. We were out on the water a couple of hours ago to show you the enormity of this disaster. While we were there, we heard on the radio the NTSB still trying to get their drug testing team on board the ship. So they're going to drug test the crew and the captain and what is called the harbor pilot. More on that in a minute. Maryland State Delegate Nick Allen is gonna be with us soon about the rebuilding process here. Divers right now are 50 feet down in absolute darkness under the boat. There are still a lot of very serious questions in terms of what happened and also how many cars and how many people might still be in the water behind them. Armin Kurdian is a retired US Navy captain who has led a number of search and rescue operations just like this one. Uh, appreciate you joining us, sir. Let's well, start with this. What is it like for these dive teams right now? We understand the U.S. Navy's on scene as well. What is it like for the dive teams in the water under the ship right now? Good afternoon, Leland. Well, imagine 50 feet of water. It's exceptionally cold. Light doesn't penetrate very much down to that depth. It's probably going to be murky, and then there's a current as well. 
So you've got a lot of factors working against you for these divers. It's hard to figure out where you are unless you have some sort of personal sort of mini inertial navigation system to understand exactly where you are uh, due to exposure uh, and the temperature. You probably don't want to be under there for very long. So you're going to be rotating divers in and out continuously. Um, at this point, I would expect to have a full or a pretty solid map of the uh, of the bed of the river and where all the vehicles are, perhaps where most of the debris is as well. So the divers are obviously going to be searching where those vehicles are expected to at least uh, hopefully, mm. you know, beyond hope at this point, finding somebody, but uh, also trying to recover uh, anybody who might be under the water. I think about also just the enormous risk to these divers. You imagine that bridge collapsing, all of that steel, and it's unstable. Uh, you've got current pushing it around. This is not a risk-free operation. No, absolutely not. Uh, these these divers are absolutely focused on saving lives. They, they don't think about themselves when they go in. It's the same for firemen or police, first responders, Coast Guard. They are so focused on search and rescue. And having been a part of a couple of search and rescues myself during my time in the Navy, that's the mindset. You just shift into a completely different gear. And all you care about is getting people safe, getting people out, and then uh, keeping your people safe at the same time. You can just imagine what it was like, the chaos at 1.30, 2.00, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning um, as they were trying to figure out how many cars and how many people um, were in the water. Uh, we, we listened to Wes Moore, that's the governor of Maryland, earlier talk about the Mayday call that came in from the ship indicating they had lost power and they were drifting towards the bridge. We don't have a copy of the Mayday call, but we do have him talking about how precious those few minutes were when they were able to shut down the bridge. Take a listen. The thing that we do know is that, uh, is that uh, many of the vehicles were stopped before they got onto the bridge, which, uh, which, which uh, saved lives in a, in, a, in a very, very heroic way. 1.30 a.m. in the morning. Uh, obviously, there were some construction crews and a number of them, six of them, uh, we believe, died uh, in this. Uh, tragic as it is. Uh, you think about this, if it was 1.30 in the afternoon or 6.30 in the morning, uh, we would have been talking about uh, dozens, if not hundreds of cars in the water, would we not? Uh, absolutely. Think about it. Uh, you mentioned the ship and the Mayday call. This crew, uh, understanding the serious predicament of their situation, no power, perhaps loss of steerage, loss of propulsion control. You saw the lights go on, the lights go off. It's very telling. Right before the impact, you see a massive plume of back black smoke coming out of the, uh, the vessel smokestack. That to me is indicative of they got the engines running and they're slamming into full emergency reverse to try to slow down their impact, hoping beyond hope that uh, when they did impact the stanchion that the impact wouldn't be uh, severe enough. But, uh, you know, 95, 97,000 pounds or tons, that's the equivalent weight of a fully, loaded, fully laden aircraft carrier, which I happen to be on a couple of times. And at that kind of weight, that kind of head-on collision, I don't think there's any amount of engineering that's going to stop something like that from happening. This is truly an awful, awful situation. They will do a full-on root cause analysis to determine why power was lost, why steerage was lost, why there was no redundancy, what may have caused that uh, the, the failure, and go all the way back to the very beginning, the actions of the crew, the actions of Coast Guard, the actions of first responder, rebuild the entire situation from start to finish so that hopefully this never happens again. Yeah, and it happened is, uh, is so quickly after it left the dock, just about 45 minutes from when it slipped its mooring lines to when it slammed in um, to the bridge. Captain, thank you very much. Obviously, our thoughts right now are with those underwater and uh, above water as well. With us okay. now, Maryland State Delegate Nick Allen represents this area of Baltimore. We appreciate you being with us. Explain to the rest of America, if you would, just how important uh, this bridge is, not just to Baltimore, but to the East Coast. Yes, yeah, so thank you for having me, by the way. No, it, I mean, this bridge is, uh, you know, it was one of the last portions of the Baltimore Beltway that was completed. So that's the full circle that goes around the entire city of Baltimore. That was completed in 1977. And when it completed that route, it offered a chance uh, for over-the-road shipping uh, containers and hazmats to go north or south uh, of the city without having to go through a tunnel or without having to go all the way around the other side. Um, so in the years since yeah, then, it also, obviously, it also opened big... up the. 
Yeah, it opened up the, the port of Baltimore, too. Fifth busiest port now on the East Coast. There's been so much made, sir, about um, the bridge itself. Um, and for such an important bridge, uh, at the same time, the pilings around it, um, which are now dwarfed by this ship. Um, you just get a sense when, it, when the ship ran into the pilings, the difference in size and, and weight and strength, that there were no major buffers. Those are the big concrete pilings that go around the bridge supports that would protect a bridge um, like this. And you can see them on the, the drone shots. Even the power poles that go across uh, the same body of water have those kinds of protections. What do you make of that? Well, I think it's important to realize, too, you know, when the bridge was completed in 1977, um, in, the, in the years since then, we've dredged uh, this portion of the Patasco River multiple times to allow for bigger and bigger shipping containers. So I don't know if the type of containers that were moving through the, the port or were anticipated to move through the port in 1977 are exactly the same containers that are moving through the port now. I know they've gotten bigger and bigger um, as we've continued to yeah. grow, and the port is one of the fastest growing um, on the East Coast and continues to be so. That being said, um, again, I am not an engineer myself, but I, I, you know, I, I saw a press yeah. conference earlier today with Secretary uh, Buttigieg, and he said he's not sure of any bridge or any engineering that could really stop, you know, these floating buildings right. that are these cargo, cargo containers. I think it's a great point um, in that there may be absolutely nothing that could have stopped this or could have withstood uh, 97,000 tons slamming uh, into it. You look, um, I was in Baltimore in 2015 for the Freddie Gray riots uh, when they burned uh, much of North and Penn. That's the neighborhood in Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore's had a very tough go of it. Uh, over the past few years, obviously, it's police forces suffering, uh, businesses suffering, crime crime is an issue here. Uh, you're going to have a court that's shut down for, what, another uh, number of months, possibly a year, a couple of years before this bridge is rebuilt. Can Baltimore sustain this kind of damage, for lack of a better term? It is going to be tough. Um, the Port of Baltimore and the east side in particular, especially, you know, the, the area serviced by this bridge, are absolutely the economic lifeblood of Baltimore City and Baltimore County. Um, you know, going back 100 years almost to Bethlehem Steel, there's a General Motors plant that was there for years and years. And now, again, the Port of Baltimore and Trade Point Atlantic are there. Um, so this is a big hit. That being said, like the governor said, you know, we are uh, Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. Um, and I know I know these people, especially, you know, my, my constituents and my friends uh, here on the east side, I know – uh, the kind of people these are, how you know what we're made of, and I know this is something that we're gonna we're gonna come through together, and we're gonna work through together, um, and we're gonna be that much stronger for it. All right, Representative, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, coming up next, navigating the waters of Baltimore Harbor are anything uh, but easy. We went out on the water today to get a firsthand look at what mariners who pilot vessels through these waters have to contend with. And why it's actually amazing that accidents like this don't happen more often. Yo! What the f What the f What the f No shot! No shot! Coast Guard plans a final briefing here in the next couple of minutes uh, about the search now for six people, at least six people, that are still missing in the waters behind me. Uh, since a large cargo ship, an immense cargo ship, crashed into one of the most important bridges in the United States. As you can probably see behind me, there are dots of flashing lights. Those are all the police and Coast Guard boats out on the water still trying to search. We're told this is a search and rescue operation. It's very difficult to believe they are going to find anybody alive in the cold, dark waters. And you can see there just how big the ship is. Well, it looks big in the pictures, but nothing quite tells you how big it is until you're able to go out and see it from the water, which is what we did earlier today. The dolly left the docks you see there with the right white cranes at about 12.45 a.m. this morning. It would have actually headed down towards the blue cranes there and swung around out into the channel. What, how many different things had to go wrong for that to happen? Boats, uh, engines failure, as it was shown in the video. Current uh, can also 
take the boat and take it to a different direction because it's going to take a long time for the boat to stop. The weather was fine, a completely clear day. We saw that, or a completely clear evening. We saw that from the video and then headed out. Where we are now is where it would have experienced one of those two power failures that you saw on the video. And as it headed out, you can see it heading. The channel actually goes to the left of where the ship is now. It would have drifted off here. You can see one of the Coast Guard boats right there guarding what is now a 2,000 yard perimeter around the wreck. Is there anything that could have stopped these boats? Nothing. That's that, 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 that thing would have cut through that bridge, and that's dead. It's, 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 it's beyond. It's, I thought, you know, maybe that thing would have sunk because of the concrete uh, uh, span there. It would have been, you know, it should have sunk the ship, too. The issue is this. 97,000 tons heading out to sea. There is absolutely nothing that could have saved this bridge. The Mayday call would have been made, again, somewhere around where we are, and they shut down traffic on either end of the bridge. It obviously wasn't enough, but it was something to save so many. The other thing that when you're out on the water that you get a sense of is how cold, how desolate, how bleak this is. Anyone who fell in the water only had a matter of minutes to survive before severe, severe hypothermia set in. It seems like you can see one of the Coast Guard boats uh, heading over towards us. They've said there's about a 2,000 yard perimeter around the boat, and that's because they're still diving uh, down below the boat. They're trying to go into the cars, see if there's any cars that still have people inside of them, and also get a sense of what kind of damage has been done. It is truly impressive when you are out on the water how the boat dwarfs the bridge itself, but more importantly, dwarfs the pilings that held this bridge up. Captain James Staples, a U.S. Coast Guard instructor, is with us. Uh, Good to see you, sir. Thank you. It occurred to me when I was out there almost that it's shocking that this doesn't happen more often. And I'll ask you the same thing I asked the captain who took us out on the water. How many things had to go wrong for this to happen? Well, that's a good question. And, you know, after going to sea for 40 years and being captain for 23, I can tell you that it doesn't happen a lot. It does happen, though. But generally, it doesn't happen this close to a bridge. Uh, Generally, most of the time, we have a problem with the ship that's at sea. So we have plenty of room to um, take care of the problems that we have. You know, yeah. as an instructor at, at my tags, we do this type of training all the time inside the simulators. Just down the street from where the accident happened, up in Linthicum at the Maritime Institute, we do a lot of the simulation training up there, um, not only with ship's captains, but crews and also pilots. And we train for this type of uh, situation. You, you said it seems almost like a perfect storm um, or, you know, sort of the, not one thing going wrong, but multiple things. The power outage being so close to the bridge, uh, the fact that, that they had a strong current and, and heavy wind last night, uh, pushing them into uh, the pilings, that there was a tight turn as they came through the slot, the channel, all, all of that led into it. You said something interesting, p- pilot. That is a harbor pilot. Those, these are the, the, the people who bring the ships in and take them out. In this case, the, the dolly was going out to sea. Uh, this is somebody who knows these waters so intimately, and yet that this still happened. Explain that for me. Absolutely. Well, the pilot has all the local knowledge of the area. What he doesn't have is the local knowledge of the vessel. And so he's going to be dependent on what he's told when he gets on board with what they call a a pilot transfer, captain pilot uh, transfer, where information is exchanged. And if the captain is holding anything back from him, such as problems with the engine or things like that, he's not going to know about that. Um, So that that can also be a big problem, and we do see that happen, that a lot of captains will not give up all the complete information that they should be uh, telling somebody that they might have had a problem outside when they were trying to get the engine to go astern and it wouldn't go astern until maybe after 10 minutes they had a slight problem. They may not pass that information on to the pilot, so he's kind of handicapped that he doesn't understand that there could be a problem with that engine. So he has local knowledge of the area, but he doesn't have the complete local knowledge of what the, what the vessel's been through. And that could be a, a major problem, as we saw here. So we're going to have to look at that and see if the ship was having any type of problems. I understand that they had been detained and there were problems with the vessel uh, earlier 
a couple of years ago. So mm-hmm. they're going to go back and take a look to see what type of problems they had. And may, if a problem was propulsion, if that was a continuous problem. So, you know, the pilot can be kind of at a disadvantage if the captain's not being honest with them. And a lot of captains do not want to be de- detained in a, in a port because it costs a lot of money to be sitting around in a port and having to go through Coast Guard inspections. Yeah. So they may be holding information back from the, ca- the uh, pilot. So he's going to have point. to find out. Yeah, he's going to have to find out real quick what's going That's on with that point. ship. And unfortunately, coming off a dock yeah, and heading towards that bridge, there's not a lot of time. And as he's trying to bring that speed up on that ship and get through there yeah. safely, being such a large ship, she needs speed to get through that that bridge. And uh, eight or nine knots is a reasonable speed to be going through. So he has good steerage. And all of a sudden, when you eight start or, getting... Eight or nine knots. Ro- ro- Captain, Captain give, me, give me eight or nine knots, um, 97,000 tons. How long would it take to stop this ship? I'm being told by our control room, just save that answer. I want your expertise on the other side uh, of this press conference by the Coast Guard. Let's listen in. The Coast Guard District, as well as Colonel Roland L. Butler, Jr., Superintendent, Maryland State Police. Uh, tonight we're going to hear from uh, a brief statement from each of them on current updates. And after that, we'll be able to take a few questions, uh, but we do need to keep it brief because we want to get these folks back to work. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Rear Admiral Shannon Gilreath. Hey, good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to say thank you to all of the first responders that have come out today to assist in looking for these individuals. We've had tremendous support across the state and county and city and federal enterprise. You've seen for yourself the helicopters flying over over the small boats that are out there, the Coast Guard cutter that's out there, the boats that go back and forth bringing people out on scene to search for these individuals. So thank you to those, this entire community for helping in that regard. Second, I want to say thank you to the community for the outpouring of support to those first responders and in particular the outpouring of support and prayers and support for the families of the six individuals. So I'd like to announce tonight that based on the length of time that we've gone in this search, the extensive search efforts that we've put into it, the water temperature, that at this point, we do not believe that we're gonna find any of these individuals still alive. And so this evening at about uh, 7.30, we are going to spend the active search and rescue efforts. Coast Guard's not going away. None of our partners are going away, but we're just going to transition to a different phase. And so I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Butler, please. Good evening, and thank you all for being here. To echo the Admiral's comments here, we really appreciate the support from the community to all the first responders here. We appreciate your patience and allowing us to do the best job possible and get the information as it comes up. At this point, as the Admiral said, we're going away from the surgery portion to a recovery operation. The changing conditions out there have made it dangerous for the first responders, the divers in the water. We will still have surface ships out overnight. At 0600 hours tomorrow, we're hoping to put divers in the water and begin a more detailed search to do our very best to recover those six missing people. Thank you. With that, we have time for just a few questions. We know there's a lot of questions uh, that still have to be answered, and we have time for just a few. So uh, if we could take a few, please. So do we think it's it's still just six? There's talk of maybe other cars on the bridge. Uh, yes, all the information we have is individuals. Is six individuals. Got it. Yes, sir. Can you go into detail uh, about how difficult this might be for the recovery uh, phase of this now? Like, what kind of challenges are you up against? Well, I'll start by saying I'm going to turn it over to the experts on diving. I'm not an expert on diving, but we've got very difficult water temperatures. You have structures from the bridge that can move with the tides and currents, making that dangerous for divers and people in the water to actually try to do recovery. And we do not want to injure any of these first responders in this recovery effort. All right, you you can hear the Coast Guard Admiral there describing much of what we have been telling you. Uh, Number one, this is no longer search and rescue. 
uh, the six people who they have accounted for having fallen off the bridge uh, when it was smashed by the dolly about 18 hours ago are now presumed to be dead. It's difficult to understand how anybody could have survived a couple of hours, much less 18 um, in the water. Divers go down in the morning once again uh, to try to survey what they have. And he spoke to an issue that I think is quite important out here is just how dangerous uh, the scene behind me is not only going to be for the next few days, but the next few months um, as they try to stabilize this bridge. There are going to be a lot of people risking their lives uh, on a daily basis uh, to try and reopen the port of Baltimore. Back here as news warrants, we're also going to keep monitoring as you can see there, the head of the Maryland State Police updating reporters, mostly on local issues uh, here as it relates to Baltimore and the traffic around it. Uh, there are some big issues as it relates to the bridge, the ship, and some big questions about what could have been done to the bridge or perhaps uh, how to hold those who own the ship responsible. We'll get to that a little later in the show. The other big news of the day is the latest on the P. Diddy sex trafficking investigation. And if these allegations are even remotely true, how did he get away with them for all these years? Why did all the celebrities flock to a man who appears to be involved or was possibly involved in something so cruel? We'll be back. All right, welcome back uh, to Baltimore. We'll update you on the bridge collapse as news warrants. Uh, this is Sean Diddy Combs pacing after HSI, that's Homeland Security investigators, raided two of his homes. He's pacing outside a private airport in Miami where private jets fly in and out of. 24 hours later, P. Diddy uh, is still a free man. His lawyer made the point to say uh, today that he is free to go and free to travel as he wishes. Uh, his suspected drug mule is not. TMZ is reporting 25-year-old Brendan Paul was arrested at a Miami airport today. He was boarding a private plane, allegedly, with Diddy. Police say Paul had coke and weed on him. News Nation national security contributor, former Los Angeles FBI agent Tracy Walders here, as well as News Nation entertainment reporter Sam Rubin. Uh, appreciate both of you. Tracy, I uh, want to come back to you. Uh, you think about sex trafficking investigation. Those are pretty uh, damning words. Uh, in a raid on a celebrity's house, both in Los Angeles and Miami. And then 24 hours later, uh, his lawyers say not only does he deny everything, but he's free to travel and uh, hasn't been arrested. Does this mean the raid was a little premature? That's a great question, and it's hard to say for sure. It may have been a little bit premature. However, I think that they actually made the right call if it was premature. What that tells me is this was all about the preservation of evidence, which I know I, I mentioned before. And the police and HSI may have had some indication that evidence was going to be destroyed, whether that was through wiretaps, uh, human assets, things of that nature. And so I think that is why they moved when they did. At this point in time, there are no charges against him. However, I'm going to be honest in that I highly suspect and expect uh, that charges will come soon. All right, you can see this new video from TMZ. This is inside their home, uh, inside uh, Combs's home after the raid. Um, I think, you know, it looks like it's been trashed. That's sort of what a a investigators do is they go through um, looking for things. I know you've been part of these searches before. Uh, you hear the term, there's a safe that appears to be cracked open. You hear the term sex trafficking investigation. What does that actually mean they're looking into? So really, most likely in a case like this, they are probably looking for digital evidence of sex trafficking. Um, a lot of times that's on computers. But what does sex on trafficking camera. actually mean? Oh, yes, sure. So really that's the movement of a person over age or under age across state borders for sex and then for receipt of payment as a result of that. So that is what he is allegedly okay. partaking in. All right, we know there's been some lawsuits with some sort of stunning allegations against him. And these allegations go back 1991. Uh, Combs allegedly drugged, sexually assaulted, videotaped a 19-year-old. Uh, 2001, uh, accused of assault, false imprisonment. 2003, accused of gang raping a 17-year-old. Uh, and then this latest, the latest allegations here uh, a couple of months ago. Sam Rubin, do you? we've seen this play before, right? A big-time celebrity, very influential, very wealthy man who has all of these allegations in his past of sexual misconduct. And yet, uh, celebrities and the rich and famous uh, don't mind. They party with him. They go to his island or they go to his house. 
uh, in this case of uh, Combs' houses in the Hamptons, in Miami, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, are, are people now in Hollywood uh, having at least, I don't know, maybe not shame, but at least regret uh, over their association with P. Diddy yet? Well, I, I think you could say uh, that uh, the silence is deafening. In other words, any of his quote-unquote friends in show business have not spoken up today. His lawyer spoke up saying that this was an overuse of military-like authority, uh, that this raid was uh, inappropriate in its intensity, and that uh, Sean and his sons were fully cooperative, as Tracy mentioned, were not arrested. Um, so with the exception of the lawyer speaking up on his behalf and, and, and saying that he will clear his name, no one else has. And what surfaced over the last uh, 24 hours or so since this raid is an interview uh, several years ago that Usher gave, saying that he spent time at uh, Holmes' houses uh, as an underage teen, and he saw, quote, the lifestyle, and that the lifestyle uh, involved a copious amount of uh, sexual activity, and that that was, uh, you know, unusual. Essentially, you know, the, the, the fantasy life that is sort of depicted in a variety of music videos encompassing many genres, including rap music, um, you know, there's what you see in a music video, and then there's what happens in real life. And do the two dovetail, and do they dovetail to the point of illegality? Uh, you, you don't see anybody yeah, know, saying, hey, wait a minute, uh, you know, I was at these house, this house, this party, none of this happened. Um, so we'll see. I think people now are keeping <laughs> so very much this- their distance, and if there is... Uh, digital evidence. I think they're hoping yeah, that's a great or, or part of it. Yeah, Sam, that is an excellent, excellent point, um, that there is nobody uh, speaking up for him. This is a guy who held some of the most famous parties uh, in the world uh, year after year after year, and nobody who went to any of them is speaking up. So that, that speaks volumes. Uh, Sam, thank you. Uh, to your point, um, Diddy's rap video from, I think it's uh, the early 90s, of him escaping on a Gulf Stream seems oddly poignant uh, at a time like this. Tracy, thank you as well for your expertise. Uh, back here in Baltimore, we all drive over bridges every uh, day. You can see live pictures there of the container ship, uh, 97,000 tons of it, dwarfing the bridge and the supports that it took down. Driving over these bridges are a fact of life, but it may be impossible to prevent the next one from being taken out. We'll explain exactly why there is sometimes nothing you can do. Plus, RFK Jr. has picked his running mate. The huge missed opportunity by the first third-party candidate since Ross Perot to have a real shot. Scientist, technologist, a fierce warrior mom, Nicole Shanahan. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. named Nicole Shanahan as his vice president pick. You might say, who? Uh, Nicole Shanahan is the founder of a tech law firm. At one point, she was married to Google's co-founder, Sergey Brin. She donated $4 million to RFK Jr.'s Super Bowl TV commercial. She's also a frequent Democratic donor. You can imagine she might be donating some to her own campaign. Latest Harvard-Harris poll shows a matchup of Biden, 38 percent, Trump, 43, Kennedy at 14 percent. Richard Goodstein's here, former Democratic strategist, former advisor to Bill and Hillary Clinton. Richard, it's good to see you. Um, it's pretty obvious that RFK Jr. pulls mostly um, from Democrats. Given, the, uh, give, given his VP pick, did Democrats just have a big sigh of relief today? Look, I think this Nicole Shanahan meets the qualifications. She's 35 and apparently born in the U.S., but she makes Sarah Palin look overqualified. Uh, I mean, and why is she there? Let's not kid ourselves, no matter what he says, it's for the money, right? That's it. Because he was really running on fumes, and uh, his biggest donor was a Trump donor, a guy who basically said, I'm not going to give to Trump and have it go to Trump's lawyers. I'll give to RFK Jr., hoping he's going to siphon votes off from Biden. So, you know, she's going to kind of pick up where that guy left off um, and I'm sure fund this campaign to a fairly well. All right. Now, to be fair, RFK Jr. was asked about that by Chris Cuomo a couple of days ago. Take a listen. Yeah, I mean, I would never choose a vice presidential candidate based upon how much money that they have. Our campaign is, you know, one of the, the principal priorities of our campaign is is bringing young people into politics. 
She's young, she's a woman, she's in tech, she's not in politics. Some people might view that as a plus. Look, I, the whole RFK can, junior candidacy is, is a joke for a couple of reasons. One, as you know, his family. Whoa, hold on, Richard, one. Richard, 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 hold on. No, 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 Richard, you can't. You, first of all, who cares what the guy, a guy's family says ab about him, whether it's two to one or three really? to one or whatever it, whatever it is? You call, you, yeah, you call, you call this a joke. OK, but 14 percent of the American people, most of whom are Joe Biden supporters, say they're voting for RFK. Isn't he, calling it a joke sort of dismissing something that could be a real problem? Well, he's running on the Kennedy name and the Kennedy family disowns him. And here's what Biden voters don't know, that he's for an abortion ban, that he's trying to convince parents not to vaccinate their kids, that he thinks that contaminated fish and water make kids gay. Uh, that Wi-Fi causes cancer. That's what Biden voters don't know. And when they learn that stuff, uh, that he's against any gun control, uh, let's, and he thinks that any depressants lead to mass shootings, Biden voters don't know that. And when they do, it's hard for me to imagine that many of them will somehow think, oh, well, he's still a Kennedy. No, he's a kook. So, yeah, again, he's getting 14% okay. or 9 whatever. But I, I just think that at the end of the day, we know this is the high water mark for most of these third party candidates. I don't think he's going to be getting anything close to this at the end. Richard, look, uh, you say when Democratic voters figure that out, the DNC is now putting a lot of money uh, and a very, uh, very skilled operative in Liz Smith behind, uh, I guess you could say, trashing Kennedy or exposing him is probably the word you would use. Um, Richard, thank you very much. We appreciate it as always. Next, uh, back from Baltimore and the fact that the federal government lists 160,000 U.S. bridges as substandard. So are disasters like this entirely preventable? Or what if we actually couldn't prevent the next bridge collapse, perhaps with even more cars on it? The cold and the dark is setting in, the black abyss behind me, and it makes you imagine what the people on the bridge last night, both those in the cars and the workers, uh, felt as a 97,000 ton ship collided into the bridge and sent them hundreds of feet down into the cold black ink water of Baltimore Harbor. It's hard to imagine, really, uh, that this bridge came crumbling down. But back in, the in 1980, the Skyway Bridge in Tampa came crashing down as well after a freighter hit a support beam just like the Dolly did last night. That Florida crash killed 35 people in cars, buses, and trucks. We'll bring in Sal Mercagliano, adjunct professor at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And Sal, I, I think about uh, these sort of incidents, and you got 97,000 tons moving uh, at about 10 miles an hour. Is there a structure in the world that can survive an impact like that? No, there are very few, especially in the maritime environment. I mean, you would hope to have some sort of barrier, dolphins, to maybe deflect the vessel away from it. But that amount of force coming at it, it's almost impossible. And you saw that the ship tried literally everything it could once it lost power to send warnings out. We know the ship's pilot, uh, the, the pilots on board sent out a radio message, and they even dropped one of the two anchors. But that was not enough to prevent the vessel from striking. Yeah, and you also saw where the ship hit the bridge uh, higher up. So even the, the protective pilings that we see now on some bridges uh, wouldn't, wouldn't have done much. If, for people who drive over bridges every day, and you don't really think about the ships that go underneath them, uh, I guess everybody did this morning as they were headed to work. But at some point, do you have to just assume that this is the risk you take driving over bridges at, at one time or another? Well, I mean, you know, this bridge was built 50 years ago, and ships at that time were a lot smaller. And so the protection that are put in place for bridges were designed for vessels those size. But, you know, over the past 20, 30 years, we've seen ships just absolutely explode in terms of size on steroids. So we do assume that everything is normal. And let's be clear, there are sh people driving over bridges right now with ships passing underneath. We do it on a common basis. Right. This is a very unique circumstance. This vessel lost its plant, the engine room, right at a key moment. And had it done it a minute or yeah. two later on either side, it would have been passed, and we probably would not even be reporting on it right now. That's a great point. Um, that 
the, 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 it's a series of events you describe, right, is the, the perfect storm, not when one thing goes wrong, but when three or four, like an airliner, crashed. And yet uh, the, the desire to politicize it almost immediately this morning uh, started. Take a listen. All right, evidently we don't have the sound bites, but I, I think to myself, uh, just to be fair about this, do we have to acknowledge that at sometimes these sort of tragic and awful and horrible things happen in the world? Sometimes they end up like the miracle on the Hudson, and sometimes they end up like they did today. No, I, I think at times we can relook at this incident and see if there were preventable errors that could be done. This vessel is a foreign flag vessel, a Singapore vessel, which is usually a very good registry. The ship got inspected by the U.S. Coast Guard in September up in New York. But was there enough inspections being done? Did the Coast Guard have enough personnel to inspect these foreign vessels yeah. that come in and out of our port? You know, were there enough, you know, should tugboats be required to be alongside that vessel going under such structures? That costs money. It takes time. So I think there are issues we can examine and take a look at. But right now, what we do know is that this vessel lost its propulsion. And the big question is why? It's either a mechanical, electrical, or a human issue that resulted in this. Yeah, and look, they, there's a data recorder uh, on these ships in the same way there's a data recorder on planes that is going to get um, to a lot of those answers. Saul, thank you very much. We appreciate your expertise. As we were out on the water uh, a couple of hours ago, we heard the calls um, from the boat bringing the drug testing team uh, to the dolly. The crew is still on it. Um, and the NTSB's drug testing team goes out uh, to get samples from the crew. Uh, that's how early in this investigation it is. But still, you are left with a, a feeling almost of humility uh, when you realize just how big the ship is and how small, relatively speaking, the supports of that bridge that carried hundreds upon hundreds of cars every hour over Baltimore with people never giving a thought about what was coming underneath the bridge. A lot more from Baltimore throughout the night. We'll see you tomorrow from Washington. In the meantime... Warnotes.com for our newsletter comes out every day at 4 p.m. Here's Chris from New York.